Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Friday the 13th Azure Infrastructure Update. So it's the 13th of October, 2023. As always, we have the updates so you can jump to any particular one you care about the most. Only one new video this week because my wife and I actually went away for a weekend for the first time in 13 years about the kids. So I took the weekend off, but I did create a video all about the VM internet access changes. So if I'm in a virtual machine, there were some changes coming for how I can get this default outbound access to the internet. I referenced it last week, but I wanted to dive into more detail about what the explicit options are to enable that access and how the current implicit, i.e. I haven't configured something works and how that's gonna change and how I need to use an explicit option. So I, I go through the options in that video. So on to what's new, there's now for the Azure Kubernetes service, a regional DR capability via Azure Backup. So Azure Backup will now take scheduled backups of my AKS cluster, geo-replicate that to the paired region, and then enable me to restore that to the same or a different cluster. Now this is gonna be useful for very long-term um, retention potentially of the state but also maybe operational recovery, uh, maybe I've done some accidental deletion, even app migration scenarios. Now, obviously, if today I have the stateful data, maybe like a database already replicating, if I have good image replication, so my container registry is replicated to another region and I have good infrastructure as code that's stored in a repo that's geographically replicated and I have good pipelines, I may not need this because I can just recreate that entire environment and my state is already replicated, but this is just a new option we have available to us. Virtual machine scale sets, the default orchestration mode will change to be flexible if I'm using PowerShell or CLI November 2023. So remember, a virtual machine scale set, a group of virtual machines that I can manage collectively has two orchestration modes. Now I've done a detailed video about this in the past. We're used to Uniform. So Uniform has a single template that is replicated a certain number of times. It can scale out and in, but they're all identical. And the virtual machines it creates are not really regular VMs that we can manage in a regular way. There are some limits on what that scale is. Flexible on the other hand, supports up to a thousand virtual machines. I can add and remove other different virtual machines from different templates and different SKUs to that set, but I can still have a virtual machine profile that behaves similar to the old uniform where it will duplicate and scale out and scale in. But even those virtual machines are regular VMs. I can still interact with them. They're regular ARM VM resources. So the goal is really VMs are VMs and this virtual machine scale set becomes a very thin orchestration layer to add and remove instances and manage and patch and group them in certain ways. Now, if I still wanna use uniform, I absolutely can. There's an orchestration mode parameter that I would just set to uniform. But the default, if I don't set something, um, is gonna change to flexible. So realize that could be a breaking change um, based on the parameters you're currently using. And then Azure dedicated host resize has gone GA. What this really means is there's different SKUs of dedicated host where I buy out essentially the entire capacity of a host. It's of a certain SKU and I can create VMs of the same SKU family of different sizes within it. What this lets me now do is very easily resize to something in the same VM family. And I have to move to a newer version. So for example, I could go from a DSV3 um, type one to a DSV3 type four. And what it's gonna do is make it very, very simple to do the migration. It'll create the new host, it'll migrate all the existing VMs and then delete the old host. So a very simple interaction. I don't have to do any manual operations for it. Um, and then hopefully I can get a better um, utilization of that new hardware. So that is now generally available. On the networking side, Express Route Traffic Collector has gone GA. So the whole point here is it lets you capture IP flows sent over your Express Route circuits. 
So I can enable that flow logs capture and it sends it to my log analytics workspace. It aggregates them every minute. So it's gonna collect and aggregate those for minute um, aggregations. And it's gonna be really useful to then go and dig into what's happening. I could think about, well, network monitoring, what's my throughput, what's my performance? I can analyze uh, traffic trends. What are the top talkers over those connections? I can do network forensics. So all of that, I can now get through that express route traffic collector. On the storage side, so Azure Files now has Unicode support when I think about the naming of folders and files. So this is really expanding the character set. And what it's doing is it's putting it on par with NTFS. So if I was taking and migrating from an NTFS SMB file share, now Azure Files will support the same file names, the same folder names that I could do on NTFS. It's gonna make those data migrations, those synchronizations uh, just a lot easier if I'm doing that from an NTFS based file share. On the database side, so Azure SQL Database now supports customer managed key, i.e. a key I have in my key vault at a per database level. And that's a pretty big deal. So before we had CMK, but it was at the server level. And remember, we associate databases with that database server object. And I could create a CMK at the database server that would get inherited by all of the databases. What this now lets me do, but only for Azure SQL Database, is if I don't set a database level CMK, it will just inherit from the server. But I could now specify a different CMK for specific databases. So imagine I'm an ISV and I've got a database server and I've got databases for 10 different customers. Well now each database could have a different CMK and that CMK could be stored in a key vault in a different subscription, even a different tenant. So a different Entra, different Azure AD tenant, maybe that's the customer's tenant. So they can hold control of the key that I'm using to do that transparent data encryption on the database. Now, again, it's only SQL DB. This is not SQL MI or any of the other services today. Um, MySQL Flexible now has universal cross-region read replica. So what this really just means is it doesn't have to be paired regions. I can have up to 10 of these asynchronous read replicas. That's really useful for DR. It's really useful for, hey, I need a local copy for read activity, maybe for analytics activity. Remember, this is all using the native MySQL engine binary log file replication based replication technology. When I add a replica, initially it will be a copy, a clone of the configuration of the source server in the same resource group in the same subscription. But once it's created, I could move it to a different resource group, even a different subscription, and I could then change the configuration. Now, you wanna be careful, don't shrink that configuration too much because it needs to be able to keep up with those asynchronous changes being sent to it. But once it's created, I do have some flexibility. And also, MySQL private link has gone GA. So this is an alternative to the existing private access where it integrates with a virtual network using a dedicated subnet. It's one or the other. So if I wanna use private link, then I have to make sure I've configured this with public access and then I can add private endpoints, which are IPs in a particular VNet or set of VNets that directly connect to that particular instance. So that's really useful if I have, for example, non-peered environments that need to be able to go and connect into that MySQL environment. Miscellaneous, so Azure Chaos Studio, the way that we can inject faults into our systems to emulate real world types of failures, like an AZ has gone down, a CPU is maxed out on a resource, whatever that may be. Well, those experiments can now target a query based uh, dynamic target. So I specify a KQL query that would specify well, which resources should be part of this target. And at execution time of the experiment, it will work out well, who should be in it. Now, when I write the query, it will show me a preview of the resources, but obviously that's at the time I'm writing the query. My resources change over time. And so realize it may not be those set of resources that would be included in that KQL at the time of actual execution of the experiment. This is gonna be really useful now to better fit our test to what actual resources exist at the time the experiment is utilized. 
And then there was basically a bug. Um, in the log alert payloads. It's being fixed the 15th of January, 2024. So when I have an alert based on a log analytics query, I get a payload back. Now, if I'm using the V1 schema, there's a result count. Well, this was showing me the latest evaluation count, not the count at the time the alert was fired. If I'm using the V2 log alerts, there's a metric value. Well, that was null. Now, V2 is if I'm using the API version that is 2020, um, May 1st. So if I'm beyond that, I'm using the V2. Basically, they're incorrect. They're gonna fix them to have the correct values. So just that's coming. And there's some new pricing tiers, which is really exciting in preview for API management. Remember, API management is all about having this single secured entry point for all of the APIs I have, no matter where they are in Azure or other clouds or on-premises that I can then publish externally or I can publish internally. And we have these API gateways which proxy the API requests, they apply the policies, they collect metrics and telemetry, and it can help me discover and consume those APIs. Well, that is a basic V2 and a standard V2 tier. And the big deal here is they're gonna have faster deployment they're going to spring up in minutes and scale in or out really quickly. They support private networking. So they both support private endpoints, but the standard V2 will support VNet integration, um, which before I think was only uh, the premium SKU. So the standard will also support that VNet integration. And they both support 10 times uh, up to 10 scale units. So it's 5x and 2.5x the actual improvement. So that is it. Um, I hope that was useful as always. Until next video, have a very safe Friday the 13th.